There have been very few positives to come out of 2020, but one of the few has been the fact that the world has been forced to slow down and take stock of what is important to us. This is certainly true for GB hockey stars Emily Defront and Tess Howard, who began the year preparing for the pinnacle of their sporting careers, the Olympics. But rather than let its postponement disillusion them, they and the GB squad see it as a huge positive because they've now got another year to prepare to fight for a medal at a third consecutive Olympics. Furthermore, it's also allowed Emily and Tess to educate themselves about social injustices, explore other passions outside of the playing field, and become part of a network that could change the face of women's sport forever. We discuss all of this across the course of the next hour, starting by finding out what it was like to return to international action in October, and the Stick It To Racism campaign created by the squad. We also talk at length about their involvement in the Women's Sports Trust Unlocked campaign, something they both describe as one of the best things they've been involved with in their lives. And we also chat about their awesome individual projects launched this year, starting with Emily's hugely popular Cuppa and Anatta series, before Tess describes how her passion to show people they can play hockey anywhere led to the development of free solo hockey. Welcome listeners to another episode of Sports Bill and I must say I am so excited for this one. Not only because I know these two very well but also because I know how passionate they are and great fun to listen to. So it gives me huge pleasure to welcome to the show England and Great Britain hockey stars Emily DeFront and Tess Howard. So first of all thank you for joining me and happy December. It feels like it's been a long year but finally we're in the, the final echelons of it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I mean, it's Christmas in my eyes, so I'm absolutely buzzing. Yeah, we were having uh, Christmas songs mid-November, so this definitely feels like Christmas. <laughs> Most important question, are the decorations up in your house yet? It's the 2nd of December as we record. Is that Against a my will, they are. Lizzie bought a tiny little Christmas tree that sits on our, above our fireplace, and she's got little Christmas lights for it. It's very cute. Tess, how is that against your will? It's the well, second the because she put it up. She put it up in November, so uh, that was the what what escaped my will. Okay, fair, fair, fair. But then I, she was like, it's just like another potted plant, just with Christmas lights. So I thought, fair enough. I assume your decorations are up then, Emily. Ah, uh, they're well and truly up. I mean, um, I've had to rein myself in slightly. Um, Anna Toman has kept that. Um, well under wraps but our tree is up we actually went out early to get a few more decorations so you know the advent calendars opened uh, yesterday the christmas songs are on the radio you know it's pretty much 25th of december in my eyes right now i don't know about you but i am actually looking forward to christmas quite a bit especially considering the year that's that's gone and i just thought we'd, we'd start off i guess don't want to reflect on the the pandemic too much but your reflections on 2020 as a whole for you sort of individually and also as the Great Britain women's team sort of unprecedented as I think being classified as the Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year or something like that it's certainly been different but but what are your yeah what are your reflections on uh, what's been a challenging 12 months? I mean it has literally just been a whirlwind of emotions you know, it, I, I mean, for everyone, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone, whether you're an athlete, whether you're, you know, just, a, you know, everyone within society, this year has been like no other. Uh, you couldn't have written what had unfolded from start to finish. Uh, no one could have predicted it. Um, and, you know, for us as Great Britain hockey players, it has been a, a test um and one that we've kind of thrived off of um i think you know we've had to adapt not only our training but you know our day-to-day -day lives and everything around it um and we've had to do that you know pretty much day in day out this year um and you know like so many other athletes we were planning and preparing for the pinnacle of our sport this summer 
um, with the Olympics um, being cancelled. We obviously had to reset slightly and go again for next year. But, you know, I, I, I think it's been a bit of a roller coaster, and I think it's been that for everyone, not just myself and Tess. I don't know whether you probably do a great test, but for the whole of society this year has been a bit mental to be honest but you know we're all coming out the other side now and I hope that 2021 is going to be one to remember for all the right reasons. Yeah so true um, uh, roller coaster is definitely the word that I'd use um, but I also think that this year's kind of given us all a lot of perspective um, not just about the about what the pandemic uh, means and how interconnected the world is but um, sort of perspective on how lucky we are to do what, to do what we do. Um, I definitely felt that in lockdown one and lockdown two, that the thing that you love the most is taken away from you. Um, so making the most of it when you're, when you get to do it. And unfortunately for us, we get an extra bout of that because now we're both um, injured. So we um, are actually, M's almost back, but it's, it's that sort of feeling of helplessness. Um, but I guess the whole community's felt that way. Uh, it's been great opportunity. I think from a women's women's um, squad's point of view and GB hockey, we we've definitely seen this as an opportunity for us to have another twelve months to be in a better place, ready for the Olympics. And um, we always said that from the start that 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 was what our aim was going to be. And I think that really helped us through lockdown was having that um, in in the sights. In, in a weird way, do you think that even though you've spent less time probably together as a squad in person than you would have done in a normal year, but do you think that you, this has actually allowed you to change your relationships and actually grow even closer and, and more as a tight unit as a squad? I think so. I think, um, you know, I think we've all been quite open with the fact that actually this year for us as a Great Britain uh, women's side, could be the biggest blessing in disguise because you know from last year we had a new head coach in Mark Hager come in um, and with this extra year now it kind of gives us that extra time that you know he can embed his playing style on on the squad and we can find our our identity as a, a squad both on and off the pitch and as well it gives us one extra year of experience um, one more year to work even harder to develop and improve both individually and collectively so actually I think if you ask any member of the squad right now although the last few months well this year has been quite quite hard for for everyone um I, I, I would agree I think that we've definitely become a lot more stronger resilient and uh, and together um through this experience and actually Hopefully, as I said, that'll be a big blessing in disguise and hold us in good stead moving into 2021. At the start of the year, it was clear to see that how, how things were changing and how things were starting to click when you, you toured Australia and New Zealand, put in some really impressive performances there and a couple of the results due to weather uh, <laughs> in particular may not have quite gone, gone your way. Um, but it felt as though there was a lot of momentum behind the squad and things were really starting to, to click and to gel. Was there that initial, was there ever sort of any initial frustration at, at, with the lockdown coming in that that was potentially going to be hampered by being away or is it a case of actually you've seen it as you've got another 12 months to get even better? Yeah, I think so. Initially it was, it was frustrating because uh, especially from the physical side, we had been pushing seriously hard, and so we were we were becoming we were getting into our peak fitness essentially, and all of that hard work you kind of felt, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to do it all over again. Um, but then we took a step back and realised that you sort of we've sort of had a dry run of the first three or four months of what an Olympic year feels like, and I know personally I put a lot of pressure on on myself. For that. And so I think having a, gone through the first few months, I'm in a better place now. And I think the squad is in a better place to, to understand those pressures and then deal with, deal with them in a different way. Um, the momentum piece that you said is exactly what we were feeling, that um, f the 
the momentum we were building was going to set us up really nicely for the Olympics. But I think that our momentum is building from now. We've taken the momentum from those February, March uh, matches and we, we've built on it, built on it in, uh, in Holland and Belgium and taking it into 2021. Speaking about those games in, in Holland and Belgium and referencing something you mentioned earlier, Tess, about how you're realising how privileged you are to, to do what you do. And um, how was it getting back out there and in the midst of a global pandemic, being able to play international hockey, albeit in, in front of empty stadia? <laughs> yeah, it was it was a really strange experience, I must admit. Um, I think the whole process of getting there was the weirdest part. But then as soon as you're on the pitch, everything just seems normal. Like I know the crowd plays, especially a home crowd, um, plays such an important role um, in our sport. But when you are in the heat of the moment, you kind of are only focusing on the game at hand. And so when you're up against those players that you have been dreaming of playing against for the last six months, um, the whole pandemic and everything becomes irrelevant. I think it's like that when you come, come back and play club hockey, you realise that when you are in the moment, that's when you kind of feel most, most free of all of these ex external pressures. And so it was, I think it was really healthy for, um, for the squad to go and get back to what we do as a living, uh, not as a living, as a, as a passion and as a, uh, uh, as a purpose because it, that I, feel, I think that that can quite easily slip when you're away from it for so long. It must have been a slightly strange experience for you um, watching on at home because it's been it's been such a an unfortunate you've had so, you've been so unfortunate in sort of the last 18 months with, with injuries and everything I guess you sort of how did you feel sort of watching it were you sort of glad the guys were back out there but also sort of gutted at the same time so sort of how how were you uh, to, to be honest I was just bursting with pride because it was one of those I, I was like so many other hockey fans in the country whereas we just wanted to see hockey on our TVs and to have you know international games being being streamed um and especially in a time where you know that lockdown two hadn't started yet but it was kind of the inevitable that was coming so it brought a big light to our lives and and for me like I I was really, um not not on the pitch playing but I felt just as much a part of 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 the squad out there and it's one of those like you see so much hard work and time and effort that goes into making the games happen in the first place there were so many different protocols that are put in place to allow you know all the teams to actually get on the pitch in the first instance so kind of being aware of that aspect as well um kind of made me appreciate it a little bit more um and also of course like I thought the both the uh, men and women's sides did really well played some great stuff got some good results out of the game so actually for me obviously personally I was disappointed to not to not be playing but actually that kind of gave me that little bit of hunger even more so that you know that there's the glimmer of international hockey um, in sight now and hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of it in 2021. And those, those games especially for the women um, if you look at the the whole context surrounding them you've got into these games with I think nine players out injured and then Sarah, Hay uh, Sarah Evans sorry um, gets an injury in the very first game you've, you've got three two or three players making their GB debuts and you you come out with a, a really impressive point against the Dutch and then a shootout victory bonus points against the Belgians and then a victory against the Belgians how how well does that bode for the women's squad that given the difficulties you've gone through not just in terms of the injuries but everything this year that you're coming out and you're getting like big results like that and you've still got quite a long way to go before the Olympics? I think the first game against Holland um, was quite a big shift in our mindset uh, that we can uh, not only compete with the top teams but be one of the best teams in the world, um, especially with our, our players, um, other players who, who would probably be in the team weren't weren't in that team 
uh, out there. Um, it was it was a strange moment when they scored the really strange goal that they scored right at the beginning of that first game. It literally in the first couple of minutes because we had actually been on top in the in the D creating circle pressure, and then there's this freak reverse stick hit that somehow gets through for a one on one, and we're all we're all standing on the pitch like, hang on, this isn't supposed to happen. We're actually on top right now, and I think. Um, maybe in previous games we would have um, gone oh my gosh here we go again or something in in that moment we all kind of like looked at each other and were like you know what they're not they're not getting back into this into this game we're gonna go and we're gonna find that that goal and I think that's the kind of spirit and attitude that we had throughout the trip it was almost like um, the resilience from the lockdown that we weren't we wouldn't give up sort of came out on the pitch in a way Um, and I think it was great to have the the likes of Sophie Hamilton and Fiona Crackles making their debuts because they kind of, they always bring something that I've learned is that the debutants sort of bring in a new energy, which is quite nice. Um, and it inspires the other players to uh, really kick on as well. So I think it just, it felt like we were there for a reason and we, and we played with that reason on the pitch. Yeah, I completely agree with what Tess said. And actually, I think those matches really showed what we're about as as a squad because you know, for, for example, that first goal that we conceded within minutes of the first game versus Holland, you know, for, for anyone watching the game, you're probably thinking, oh gosh, here we go, like this is going to be very one-sided. But actually, the character and the the desire and the, you know, as Tess said, like the perseverance with it all um, really shone through in that first game, let alone the other fixtures that came after and and actually you know the, the the new the new additions to the team for that trip and hopefully we'll get their opportunities again in the near future that really highlights the strength in depth with the squad and you know the EDP squad and the youngsters coming through that actually GB hockey is in a very good place and actually you know those those matches over the last over the last month or so kind of really signified that even you know, after the year that we've all had um, and had to overcome. Something that, that Tess mentioned there was sort of the, the resilience that lockdowns taught you. And, and Mark Hager, I've spoken to him previously in, in a work-related capacity about this. And he says, you plan for every eventuality, but you couldn't plan for COVID initially when it struck. But now you've planned for COVID and you've got through that. Does that sort of say to you as a squad that, you know, you can get through a global pandemic, you can get through anything, including going 1-0 down to the Dutch inside 90 seconds. I think so. I mean, if you look, honestly, if you look back over the last four years, the GB women's hockey team have had to overcome a fair share of, you know, things against adversity, kind of, you know, not just the global pandemic, but other things both on and off the pitch. So I feel like, I don't know whether I'm a bit biased because obviously I love us, but we take it in our stride and it is it's one of those, like you plan for everything that you can plan and you control what you can control. Um, but actually, I don't think we're phased. I think we just try to take it in our stride. Um, you know, I'm not saying that things are always uh, sunshine and roses. You know, it, it is tough, but um, I think, you know, if you look back over the last year, we have had to overcome what we've had to overcome. But actually, you know, moving forwards, I think now only um, hold it in good stead, hopefully. You're listening to Sportspiel, the players podcast. Another new addition that you had to uh, the trip when you went out um, to the ne- Netherlands and Belgium was um, the Stick It to Racism campaign as well. That was something that was very new, launched uh, officially just a few days before. Um, I guess if you could explain a little bit more about what that is and, and how it came about, because you guys were... Um, as as the women's team is in particular driving forces behind that and it's a fantastic campaign uh well the stick it to racism campaign really has come out of um us as a squad believing that there is no place for racism 
in hockey, uh, in sport, in society. Uh, and we felt uh, strong, strongly enough that this is, this is not something, it's not, it's not even a, it's not even a movement. It's, it's what it should be is that we, we should not accept racism. And uh, through the work of our, so we, we created a working group um, to uh, spearhead our, our response um, because coming together to show that uh, we are sticking it to racism, that is where the, um, that is where the sort of, I guess, slogan, the, the movements come from. Um, and I think M's probably a better, better place to explain behind, but every member of our squad believes it, that there is no place for racism. And that's, I mean, that's as simple as it, as it is. Yeah, for, for me, I think, um, you know, just to touch upon what Tessa said, is, is, you know, I think everyone in the country, everyone around the world was kind of, you know, really moved by uh, what happened to George Floyd. And that kind of kick-started obviously the Black Lives Movement, but actually it got people talking more and about this, this issue that is faced by so many people within society on a daily basis. Um, obviously us as a women's squad, we're all very, um, you know, aware that we are all, um, you know, from a very privileged position as white females, you know, we don't necessarily have um, many ethnic minorities. I mean, Reese Smith in the men's squad, um, being being one 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 huge role model um, for our sport. But actually, you know, we feel very strongly as a women's squad that our our sport is one of the best things that you do. You know, we all love the sport. We have such a passion for the sport, and we feel like everyone should be having the opportunity to play our sport and be comfortable in in a, in a society that the hockey family is. They shouldn't be, you know, feel restricted because of their colour of their skin or their gender or their background. Um, and, you know, especially with kind of, you see the sports trying to do their bit. So, for example, the footballers taking a knee um, uh, um, amongst one of many examples. We felt really passionate that, we want to show our support to stick it to racism um, and we want to show that in terms of moving forwards we want to continue to educate ourselves we want to continue our learning as a squad but also individually and you know we're we're so passionate to help to support GB hockey in this matter to you know really tackle racism because as Tess said um, there is just no place for racism in our sport. Do you think, uh, as a squad and as individuals, have you also sort of recognised that the fact that you are international athletes and that you spoke about Reese being a role model, but you are essentially sort of people do look up to you, especially sort of young kids, and it's been really noticeable how um, quite a lot of you um, have been really good at sharing articles that you've read and trying to things that you've used to educate yourselves, but sharing them to educate others as well. Is that something that you've sort of recognise that you can do is that you is continuing to talk about it to highlight the injustices and, and allowing others to to educate themselves in the way that you're doing it as well yeah I think so the the first thing that anyone can do is just educate themselves and it's um it's it's not the responsibility of the minority group to educate the those those who are unaware it's our responsibility to um, educate ourselves and take take ownership of the the current situation. I think, and there's so much that um, that I was not aware of that I am slowly beginning to understand. And um, I think through social media, it's it's a it's a good way to help others to see that you should be, everyone should be educating themselves. And um, the odd article here and there makes a huge difference to um, building a, a, I think a, a more accurate picture of what our society is like. Um, so I, I'm, 
fortunate that my geography degree has given me a a, a world view, a, a, a broad range to, um, of, of topics to study, like colonialism. But when you think about what we were taught at school, we we weren't we weren't taught about um, about colonialism and uh, of the the atrocities of the slave trade and and how it's still prevalent in today's society. And I think um, the outcomes of those structural inequalities are still here. So without you, can, you can't brush over it because we're in the twenty first century. You know that's just not. Um, conducive to a society that will operate fairly so um, I think social media and sharing those articles um, and highlighting that it's still here and that we have the responsibility to change it I think is, is something that Em and I were on a um, on a, a podcast well, a, a webinar with the Women's Sports Trust with Michelle Moore and she she explained that you have you have to be an anti-racist that which means you have to take action to educate yourself and to be better. Um, and it's not something that you can just turn on and turn off. You, you have to actively continue to do that. So I think that's really important. And as you said, we, we, whether, we, whether we think it or not, we are role models and young kids. And, and I think that a whole host of, of different people kind of, they look to you to see what you're doing. And um, if, if you are passionate enough I mean, you don't even have to have, be passionate. You just have to be passionate in an equal society. I mean, <laughs> that's that's all it is, really. Um, and so, I think it's really important that we do share um, that. That is important. Is that uh, is that something you'd agree with then? Um, as well, is that something that you find really important as well? Yeah, I mean, just touching upon what Tess said about um, you know, this is the time to be anti-racist. It's not. It's not a case of yeah i agree i don't think you know racism is is it should be tolerated within society actually this is the moment now that actually now more than ever like i've had numerous conversations over the last few months i've, I've felt really really fortunate enough to have some really powerful conversations with you know black individuals that have had to deal with you know th this being you know a black so for example a black female playing elite sport um that's something they've had to deal with every single day of their lives and sharing their stories kind of really opens your eyes and makes you realize i need to do more here they're like the number of people i've had these conversations with and they've said i'm just fed up i'm tired of sharing my story with everyone i'm tired of you know saying how I'm treated differently, I'm spoken to differently, you know, you need to do more. And actually, now is the time, like, we need to be allies of our black counterparts. And um, I actually watched, I mean, quite poignant, really, but I watched the Anton Ferdinand documentary um, on BBC iPlayer a few hours ago. And again, like, so powerful, so raw, the whole documentary, obviously, talking about... Um, the incident with um, Anton Ferdinand and John Terry back in, I think it's 2009. Um, but a quote that really stood out for me in the, in the documentary, it was something like, um, you know, suffering in silence and not talking about it is racism in itself because Anton Ferdinand didn't feel like he could talk about it and talk about the injustices that he'd faced um, in that incident, but also as a result of the incident. And as Tess said, obviously, for us as role models and seeing ourselves kind of, you know, to, to share our opinions, our views, but also to help support and highlight these issues within society is something for me, I think is really, really important. Do you, you mentioned earlier about how you think the lockdown and the pandemic has been a, a blessing in disguise in terms of the development of the GB women's team. Do you also think that it's actually also a blessing in disguise in terms of social issues such as, as racism and the way black people are treated, but not, not just that, but also the presence of like fem women in sports and, and generating conversation about that, especially with sort of the way that m the, the return of men's sports has been prioritised over women in certain areas and, and other social issues as well. Do you think that actually 
what's happened in the world has actually been a blessing in disguise and it's given us time to sit down become more aware of it educate ourselves and start doing something about things that otherwise people might have brushed under the carpet because they didn't have time yeah i think so um i think well for me you know you know that i'm a big advocate and supporter of all things women's sport and um i think particularly during um lockdown 1.0 there was a lot of chat about how you know the momentum of women's sport is going to be lost all of the the hard work you know the coverage the attention that women's sport has kind of uh, received over the last decade say um the upward trajectory it was on is going to be halted because of the the global pandemic that we faced ourselves in but actually i think again you know you look at the return to play in football for example I think the women's game, you know, the WSL, you see matches on the TV every single week now. You know, they're on BT, they're on BBC. Um, there's a lot more coverage. And actually, you know, I think the attention and the desire to watch women's sport right now um, is is still is still huge. And actually, I think, you know, I, I don't know whether that is a direct correlation from from coronavirus but actually you know the 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 conversations being had women's sport is you know being taken seriously and actually for me um obviously as a as a, a gb hockey player but also as a huge supporter of all things women's sport um i think yeah it's a huge thing yeah i'd agree um i think the the pandemic has slowed the world down in a way. Um, so other social causes can be taken seriously, like M says. And um, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a blessing in disguise because I think so, so many other things have come out which um, aren't, aren't a blessing. <laughs> but um, for the majority, I. And, and I think um, to be able to stop and reflect on what our society is right now and what it should be, I think that's what the pandemic's given us. Um, whether that be about how, how connected the world is, I think that's shown in, in the Black Lives Matter movement that, that the world is connected and is in support of each other. Um, through in, in many different parts of the world um, and that people are passionate across the world and I think that has really come to the fore um, <laughs> whether it be the fact that you can um, talk to someone across Zoom who's in the middle of nowhere in you know Australia or something you know that sort of connectivity I think that technology has brought is now felt sort of between people um, uh, and so for women's sport, I think it's, I think it's just helped us to realise that women's sport shouldn't just be thought of as women's sport, should just be thought of as sport. And when people were lacking in sport, they, they wanted any sport and then they realised how amazing women's sport was. So um, I think hopefully in that respect, it, will, it, has, it, it has done a good thing. Sticking along the theme there of women's sports and the, the being connected, uh, you said just before we started recording that um, this is your your third uh, Zoom call together in 24 hours, and one of them was a webinar with the Women's Sport Trust, who you've been a part of their Unlocked program alongside another 38 elite athletes since it was launched earlier this year, and actually you've been able to spend a lot of time sort of connecting with people and, and taking part in that over the last few months. Um, I guess sort of a very broad question to ask, but sort of how did the opportunity to, to be part of the programme come about and and yeah, how did you how did you get involved in the first place? So it's actually it was probably this time last year actually that um our GB hockey perform uh, lifestyle um performance lifestyle advisor, Emma Mitchell, got in touch with a few of us um to let us know about, you know, the women's sports trust the launching a new kind of campaign slash program um, for, for sportswomen to get involved. And basically it was just about trying to, 
you know, raise the attention and the profile of, of women's sport and, and doing that kind of as a big, wide collective. Um, and it was one of those, like, I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday. So I actually um, was recovering from my concussion at that moment. And I, I struggled to, um, to be looking at screens at that time. And I saw this email and I was kind of thinking, gosh, how am I going to process writing an application for this you know program because don't get me wrong I mean as soon as I saw it I was like that's a bit of me I really want to get involved in it um but I was worried I hadn't really looked at a tv screen or my phone or my laptop in in weeks so it was one of those I was like do I don't I um I obviously ended up applying I think it took me far longer than it probably should have done um, in terms of writing my application and, and probably the consequences of it afterwards. I was probably in bed for the next week, but we don't talk about that. But um, yeah, and I just, I just remember thinking I want to be a part of it. And I was a well, well aware of the fantastic work that the Women's Sports Trust do um, for women's sport in terms of raising the profile and getting more people talking about it and taking note of, of the fantastic thing that is women's sport. And um, I can honestly say it has been one of the best experiences of my life. It's been an absolute honour to be part of the Unlocked programme. Um, I've learnt so much. I've met so many incredible uh, women, you know, whether that's athletes or the activators involved or people further afield within that in terms of their connections with the Women's Sports Trust. And um, yeah, I can't speak more highly of, of the whole programme and those involved within it. Um, that story of you writing your <laughs> your uh, application reminds me of, of of how I did mine. And so basically, you could either send in a video, which was only supposed to be about a minute long, or you could write a little paragraph. And I was like, no, no, I definitely need to do this as a video. So I did this video, and then looked at my like camera, and I was on like five minutes of describing what <laughs> I wanted to be in this. <laughs> And so I, I emailed I emailed Claire um, Claire Bennett and I said, "Is it okay if my video is five minutes?" And she's like, "Yeah, sure, just send it across." And then the, it wasn't like the email wouldn't allow the size of the attachment. So then I had to just write a little paragraph. I was like, "How am I going to explain in this one paragraph why I want to be part of this Women's Sports Trust?" But um, the the Unlock Program, oh my word, uh, yeah, like Em says, one one of my best experiences of my life. Um, I actually think it was probably my my uh, social awakening, probably <laughs> um, into the community of um, of women's sport. Uh, it combines like sporting excellence with gender equality, inclusion, policy change, media training. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, I mean, social change. It's just. It's just so um, important for today's society that we have this this network of people who are who want to, to action change. That was the most exciting thing for me. They said, "Say three things that you want to achieve in this program," and I was like, "How big can I go?" <laughs> um, but it's sort of just it's ignited that um, that spark uh, for um, doing something to to help society. So. The Women's Sport Trust Unlock program, you both explained that how you've been a part of and how you joined it. What was that first meeting like when you're on a call with 38 other athletes, um, 34 of whom, I thought 35 of whom you, you may not have met before from, from other different sports and some big names in there. I mean, I'd humble brag here, but the two of you on our podcast means that 13 of the 40 athletes as part of the program have appeared on Sports Bill. So humble brag. Um, but there's some big names, Stacey Copeland, Marilyn Okoro, Steph Reed, Kate Cross. What was that sort of first, yeah, the first session like? It was a bit of a weird one, actually, because we, we actually couldn't make the main launch event. So the main launch event was in Manchester at the BBC uh, studio. So obviously we're all gutted to miss that but we had a um a kind of mini launch event with a few other athletes that couldn't make um the original a few days 
beforehand um, at, you know, the wonderful home of Great Britain hockey, Bisham Abbey. And before, before kind of the launch event, we got sent across uh, the other athletes that were part of the part of the program and some of the activators that were also um, involved because every athlete was partnered with an activator. Um, these activators were from a range of different, you know, fields within, you know, media or, or or literally every kind of industry possible was ticked off with the list of activators involved but I remember I don't know about you Tess but I remember looking through the the list of the athletes involved and thinking blimey how have I talked myself into this like how how have I managed to get on the list of people such as you know Karen Bardsley um and um you know, as you said, Stacey Copeland, Marilyn, like list was actually ridiculous. And there, there we were. Um, and there was five other, there was five in total GB hockey um, athletes. So we were kind of strength in numbers on that first, um, first session at, at Bisham Abbey. But I just remember thinking you, you kind of got a glimmer of how special the programme was going to be from that very first moment that you walked into the room um and from that moment i i was just so excited for what for what was to come obviously they'd planned for something completely different to what actually happened because of the global pandemic um but again i think you know the women's trust what they still managed to do and provide the service that they did for all of us if you ask anybody involved they would think you know it, it was probably above and beyond what we would have expected um and and it probably single-handedly kept me sane in the first lockdown because we had weekly hangouts um and these hangouts would be again via zoom but would include you know athlete spotlight sessions where numerous different athletes would share their athlete stories each week and then we'd have guest speakers come in we had a whole host of different webinars um and honestly i, I look back and i think I question how they managed to pull it off and pull off something so special and so spectacular. But gosh, when I look back on it, I was, I just feel so proud and lucky to have been involved and, and yeah, I genuinely loved every single second of it. Yeah, that's exactly how, how I feel. Um, um, (laughs) Googling everyone and then just being like, whoa, (laughs) Crikey. I mean, to be fair, when I walked into the Bisham Abbey um, little launch thing and I saw Maddie and Holly and yourself just standing, I was like, whoa, okay, so this is actually like the real deal. Um, (laughs) I think, uh, I mean, being partnered with an activator was incredible to think that you could, you could almost be mentored by this person. And um, and my activator was Susie Levy, and I and so basically what they what they did was they gave you an envelope and you open the envelope and inside oh. was your activator and yeah M's, M's reminiscing, um, and I saw Susie Levy and then they have like a little paragraph about what they do, and she is it she is it she currently is still in the she's in the home office um, as a non exec director and has her own uh, business for diversity and inclusion and. Um, I was literally just starstruck, honestly, um, sent her a message saying, I cannot wait to get started. And, um, when they, they literally said, whatever you want to do, you, we will, we'll help you make it happen. And I was like, uh, what about, um, potentially changing, uh, school sport uniform policy? And they're like, sure, why not? <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, that's my that's my aim but I mean we're not going to get there in one year but um, <laughs> she, Susie definitely wanted to get there within about a week and I was like whoa slow down slow down um but it was just incredible um I think it made me feel like um well there's, there's this great there's this great quote which says uh I stand on the shoulders of the women before me hoping to make that mountain a little bit taller so that others can see further or something to that effect and that's really what being part of the women's sports trust made me feel um being part of a a group of women who wanted to make change and (laughs) 
my favorite quote, like actual favorite quote is courage calls to courage everywhere, which is Millicent Fawcett, who as a, in 1920s, uh, she, she was a suffragist and um, was critical in leading the suffrage, suffrage movement for women's equality and women's votes. And um, courage calls to courage everywhere is how I felt every time I would join the Women's Sports Trust Hangouts, those meetings that, that they showed through their courage, through their vulnerability, showed me that I could, I could do the same. And I just feel utterly inspired every, every time I was part of it. Make sure you follow Sportspiel on social media. Search for Sportspiel Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or on LinkedIn. Tess, you called it your your social awakening um, earlier on. I guess sort of probably quite difficult to quantify from from what you said. But what were your biggest learnings or the things that have have really stood out to you that you, you've taken away either from uh, a talk that was given um, by another athlete or a guest speaker or from from time spent with your activator sort of what of the if it's if it's possible to answer that question because I imagine there must be loads but what are the biggest standouts well I'll I'll restrict myself to two because otherwise I will be here for days um the first thing I learned was that everybody has a voice um, and it's your choice how you use it um, and what you use it for. Um, so for me, that meant understanding that other people ha can have used their voices for what they care about um, and that they've put their energy into, into their passions, not just on the pitch or, or in their sport but through the things off the pitch which actually at the end of the day matter more i think um and the second thing i learned is that there is a network of people waiting <laughs> to help you um and if you are yourself and you uh, speak honestly and passionately um and hopefully articulate yourself articulate yourself well enough um they will help <laughs> Um, make your dreams uh, come true and I use the word dreams because I think it's important to be an idealist a realist uh, and an optimist because those three come together and you can actually make change I think if you're too, you're too too realistic in the current time and you can't see what the future could be then you're then you're stuck if you're too optimistic and you can't see what you're doing what what the society is right now then then you also will be stuck. So it's having that balance. And I think being connected to an activator or being connected to this network of people who, who are actioning things already, that made me see that I had to, um, I guess, make what I wanted to achieve or, or the change that I'd like to help um, make it doable because then you build momentum. Um, and so that's what I learned. How about yourself, Emily? Um, yeah, so for me, I think, um, again, touching on what Tess said, I think for me, it's kind of the, the community feeling and that you were part of a bigger aspect of society. So, you know, you, you've got, it was 41 athletes and 41 activators uh, coming together with, with the Women's Sports Trust to, you know, really build upon the momentum that women's sport is having right now and it's kind of it, it was i saw it as a huge support network and uh, it really did have that collective community feeling every single session you joined or the webinar that you joined and you know we had a whatsapp group as well and and that was always buzzing with you know whether it be you know performance updates or just updates of what people are doing uh, with themselves to keep themselves busy but it was a real aspect of a group of people coming together to make real meaningful change and and have a really positive impact within society and actually i think if you look back and 
and and what was achieved by the Women's Sports Trust through their Unlock campaign. I think, you know, that has well and truly been achieved. And the fact that they're looking to uh, do another uh, Unlock program next year as well kind of highlights the the real power of it all and and the momentum that they're building with it. Um, but also for me, one of the main things was kind of finding um, my purpose. So what I mean by that is that the very first session that me and Tess have spoken about at Bishop Abbey, they kind of asked, okay, what do you want to get from this, um, from this program and you being involved? And I remember I sat next to Maddie Hinch at this point and we both kind of looked at each other and we were like, oh, that's the question, isn't it? That's the million pound question. I mean, there's just so much that you want to do. Um, but actually asking that question then kind of really got me thinking, okay, what do I, what, what's most important to me? What do I want to, um, make a, a difference in or, or, or work towards? And, you know, there's numerous things that have happened off of the back of my involvement within, uh, the Unlock program that maybe I wouldn't have had the confidence to whether get involved in or start myself or, or, or do um previously but actually I think you know I found my purpose in terms of the stuff that I'm most passionate about and things that I want to really influence moving forwards and actually I think that's you know a, a, a huge knock-on from my involvement within Unlocked. Something that you've you started doing recently and has, has been a huge hit amongst a huge community on social media is the, the development of Capra and Anatta. Is that something that, that came about as a result of the Unlock program as well? Did they sort of give you that idea and, and the confidence to actually go out and execute it? Um, I think, I, I'm not going to lie, it probably was, uh, it did have a factor, 100%. So um, my activator was um, the legend that is Jackie Oatley. So Jackie is you know, one of the leading uh, football sport broadcasters in this country. Uh, she was the first female commentator on Match of the Day. Uh, she does fantastic work. She, she's one of the um, darts um, commentators, lead uh, broadcasters for ITV right now. She, she's a fantastic woman. And I'm not going to lie, when I saw the list of activators and was looking down, I was like, Jackie Oatley would be you know number one on my list and I'm not just saying this and honestly it was very similar to what Tess said earlier about you know that moment where you open the envelope and uh and saw Jackie and and I have I have a real interest outside of hockey in terms of journalism and broadcasting and you know I, I love it when you see female commentators or or broadcasters on on the tv and for me personally I don't think there's enough but Jackie really does lead the way in that. And she, she's been a huge trailblazer for so many that have come after her. Um, and yeah, seeing, see, opening that envelope kind of was like, wow, this is it. And I remember, I remember meeting her for the first time and I was picking her brains, asking too many questions to, to, uh, to, to my own good, I bet. But um, from that meeting, I can't, it kind of got me thinking like, how can I, how can I do what she does basically? Like, how can I get involved? And, and then obviously lockdown came. And as I said earlier, in terms of, there was a lot of questioning about women's sport and the lack of um, coverage during lockdown, because obviously, you know, all elite sport had, had stopped in that period of time. And there was a lot of, lot of chatter about, um, you know, what, what could happen? What's the future of women's sport going to look like? And um, yeah, like my, my, one of my biggest passions is women's sport and talking about sport and watching sport, playing sport, everything. And also my other passion is drinking tea and talking, as you can probably tell. Like, so I tried to put it all together and came up with Cuppa and Natta, a weird and wonderful um, idea. And I guess, you know, three series later, I think there's been 30 episodes and I've, you know, had the complete honour and privilege to um to talk to so many incredible women that I've looked up to for fr throughout my whole life and they're from a range of different sports backgrounds you know um roles that they uphold within within um sport right now but are huge figureheads within women's sport and yeah I've loved every bit of it
So you say three episodes, uh, three series, 30 episodes, some really incredible guests. When you, when you were launching that first episode, sort of going into it right at the start, did you think it would be as successful as it, it, it has become? No. <laughs> um, no. I mean, it was one of those. I was like, I want to do this. If it flops, it flops. But I'd, and I enjoy it, talking about sport to um to these people so if it flops it flops we'll just see how it goes and I'm not gonna lie I've said this very openly I went in hard with the big dogs so I, I got Alex Stanton Bennett on board in the first episode and I feel like from then I just used people's names to try and get the next <laughs> and uh honestly, like, I can't I can't fault anyone anyone that's been um one of my guests, they have been so generous with their time. Like, you know, some, some, well, most of the guests actually, I've never actually met in person. So it's all kind of, you know, chatting away virtually and, and, and trying to talk my way into them giving 30 minutes of their time to have a cup of tea with me. But yeah, I don't, to answer your question, I don't think I quite, um, I wouldn't have predicted what was to come. I mean, you know, sharing a cup of tea with Claire Baldin, you know, Dane Catherine Granger, Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson. I mean, th yeah, there's just everyone that I've I've uh, shared a couple with. It's been unbelievable, and uh, yeah, I, I hope I hope that it can continue for for however long it is. I think what you did so well, um, and what you continue to do is you make it accessible to anyone, and because of your personality. You look genuinely just look forward to listening to your conversation. And so much so that I was waiting on Instagram <laughs> for like <laughs> 20 minutes. Where's Cup and Anatta <laughs> to, to realize that they had now moved to YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> I was refreshing your Instagram <laughs> so much. Um, the first, but, oh the first episode of this series, wasn't it? And and I remember uh, we had a gym session the next day after, and Tess came up to me and was like, "I literally sat on Instagram refreshing your feed for about twenty minutes, waiting for you to come on live, not realizing that actually we've shifted things on, and it's just going straight onto YouTube." Bless Tess. I mean, I. I do appreciate it, girl, though, like you taking the time to, to watch it. But, uh, yeah. No, it got me through lockdown for big time. <laughs> you mentioned accessibility there, there, Tess, and that sort of brings me on quite nicely to your project that you've been working on as well, Free Solo Hockey. <laughs> uh, if anyone checks that out on, on Instagram and, and your website and everything, um, you'll see that you are showing people that you can literally play hockey anywhere in any scenario you don't need a pitch or anything um and like the ingenuity and some of the ideas on that is amazing uh, how did the how did the whole project in in that respect come about for you uh i guess it started in lockdown when i was deprived of a pitch and dragged my <laughs> little brother out into the garden to tell him that it was uh, essential that we continue our hockey training um, and so he, he started off as my cameraman. We were doing these siblings, siblings, um, hockey videos. And to be honest, um, <laughs> it started actually when, so Maddie Hinch did a video, um, of swivel saves, which is apparently a goalie term. I mean, it's just nonsense, but yeah, apparently it's a swivel save. <laughs> um, and I, <laughs> I wanted to do a, a mimic version of a swivel shot. So I brought out um, my, um, obviously taking it completely seriously, um, <laughs> brought out these the dog beds from our, from our um, uh, house into the garden and taught, basically taught people how to dive onto dog beds so that they could practice goal scoring. Um, and then what's, what followed was just a whole host of random videos about how you can train at home um, with a little brother or by yourself um, mm. and then I had been playing with an idea of of like that you can you should be able to play anywhere and this is probably where it, come, it comes to the idea of free solo hockey um, to break down literally and metaphorically the, the boundaries of hockey which is an astroturf 
and it's no it's no secret that it's you have to be able to play an 11 side game on an astro turf probably these days um it's hard to book um astro it's it's hard to um have all of the equipment available that most hockey um skills video stuff requires um and i really wanted to just break it down and say that you can play anywhere and you can train as creatively as you like and it genuinely came out of me wanting to train continue to play because i was missing that um adrenaline that i get from hockey i was missing the creativity and it kind of it always sparks something inside me i mean i'm literally after every training session i'll, I'll stay for like 15 minutes afterwards smashing balls because uh, and trying new skills because that's what makes me feel alive um it, and it excites excites me and so i wanted to bring that um in some small way um to help kids especially in lockdown too to um continue to play hockey because it was it was taken away um it's a bit random, but I guess it's a bit of me. <laughs> the ideas for the videos, I mean, they're creative. Are they things that you've, you literally sort of think up sort of on the day or are they things that you sort of, you've, you've done before? No, honestly, I turn on the camera and just see what happens. <laughs> it's, it's, there's not a lot of planning. I can tell you that. I, I tried to plan and if I plan, it, it's not, it's not fun. Um, and I wanted, I was conscious that um, I'm doing a, a, a full-time uh, university degree and obviously being a full-time athlete and I was conscious of my own time because I, I give so much to my degree um, and obviously the hockey program is, is very, very full on. And um, I wanted to, to still be able to like find that freedom to be able to be creative um and to show kids that they can also find that that five minutes um to practice their skills and so i literally i mean yesterday i was just in my pajamas just switched on the camera and just yeah something something came out um uh some hockey skills <laughs> um <laughs> <but> yeah <laughs> um yeah i guess that i mean i mean i just ramble on forever but i mean um i just think also, it's important that young kids see female players doing that, um, playing, playing for the sake of playing um, and showing that you can be skillful. Uh, I mean, attempt to be skillful, I guess. But it's really aimed at, really aimed at children to keep them, keep them active and keep them excited. Um, I know Em does them in her spare time, but um, it, the, the target age is... <laughs> it's, 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 no. I'm still working on my Devante. <laughs> in terms of, you made, you made a good point there about how you're saying that sort of hockey has this this image, and that in order to play a hockey game, it, it is largely a case of having to have an Astro and, and being eleven aside and things like that. And there are a lot of perceived barriers that hockey has around it, um, both in terms of sort of access in terms of equipment but then also access in terms of sort of the stereotypes that that surround the sport but one thing that's really noticeable amongst all both squads is is the work that you guys do to to take hockey to other areas and to make it accessible so test with your project showing that you could play hockey anywhere around the house reese with his project taking hockey into inner cities you know so many of you guys do coaching camps uh, Slo ian sloan has been running coaching camps for people to do on zoom in their own gardens how important is it for you to as athletes in terms of sort of inspiring the future and showing that actually hockey your passion what you're passionate about anyone can do it if 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 they want to i think it's at the heart of what uh gb hockey wants to be about um joining the women's program at right at the start or about two years ago for me uh, I became very aware of the vision that GB Hockey, the women's squad, have put forward for the last six years, which is, oh, sorry, eight years, um, be the difference, inspire the future, create history. And the inspire the future part for us as a, as a squad is so important um, about taking hockey to the next level and showing that it's a game that literally anyone can play. And... I think it's like it is the sleeping giant of sports 
um, I'm, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm campaigning for a, not really campaigning, but I would love a five-a-side social hockey league, like indoor hockey, but outdoors. Literally, that is my dream. Um, <laughs> but in any way for possible, taking the, the skill set, the technical ability of hockey is just gorgeous to watch. And then you've got the tactical and the team awareness. And I think it, it has to be brought to the wider audience because it's just, it is the sleeping giant of sports. Yeah, for me, I think it's, um, you know, we, we've touched upon it in terms of the inclusion aspect of our sport. And actually, you know, for example, well, as you said, so Tess is fantastic free solo hockey, Reese's inner city um, hockey that he does within within London. You've got other aspects of that. Maddie, Maddie Hinch has got her own um, her own hockey coaching um, camps that she's been doing. Obviously, going to be uh, releasing an app in the in the new year, which is really exciting. Um, you know, Alex Stanks and Bennett, she has her own academy. You know, Ian Sloan. The, the list goes on, and it and it's one of those. I think it's really important to make hockey accessible, as you said, for everyone no matter what your age, no matter what school you go to, no matter whether you've got, a, you know, a disability. Um, for, for both squads, I think that's something that we wholeheartedly hold, you know, so, so strongly in terms of our, in terms of our values. Um, and it's things like, it is things like, so um, the Flyers Hockey um, initiative that, um, that has been set up um, by England Hockey Accessible coming together and making hockey accessible for any individual, whether you have a learning disability or a physical disability or, you know, every member of the family can get involved in Flyers Hockey. And that's just one of many, many initiatives and programmes that are already existing within our sport. And I think the fantastic work that people such as Tess are doing is highlighting that you know there shouldn't be any boundaries or barriers to play our sport we all love our sport for you know the reason that it brings us so much happiness you know you you meet some fantastic people um and, and it's just so powerful and actually you know if we can as GB hockey players kind of as Tess alluded to inspire the future in terms of getting more people to pick up a hockey stick, no matter what age you are. Um, you know, I think that that's our good job done. Um, and it's something that we are all very, very passionate about. And hopefully the great work that you're all putting in will, will start to reap the rewards when we can all start to safely return to playing hockey, which for some of us is, is going to be very soon, but for others is going to be a little while yet. Uh, I, I'm conscious that we are, we have been on this call for quite a while now and you've probably got very busy evenings planned, but just wanted to finish off by asking quite a broad question. Um, but we're nearly at the end of a, a testing 2020. Hopefully 2021 is going to be millions of times better. And hopefully we'll see you guys in action. Uh, there's a lot of games due to be played next year. So hopefully a lot, but what are you most, what are you most looking forward to about 2021? Goodness. What's a question. Um, looking forward to the opportunity uh, of 2021, whatever it brings. I think I feel more equipped to um, take whatever comes. Um, I feel more grateful for the opportunities that will hopefully arise um, through 2021, and I and I and I feel even even hungrier for all for it. Um, the sort of what 2021 could, sorry, it's quite a bit of a tongue twist at 2021. Mm -hmm. um, what it could represent is, I'm thinking from like a global point of view is, um, we can beat the virus as a collective, um, as a whole, as a whole world coming together. And I hope that the Olympics will represent that for us as a as a human race. I know that's quite a big thing to say, but but <laughs> it's the opportunity for us all to come together and celebrate something as um, 
innate to humans, which is just playing, playing sport. And I just can't wait to have a, the opportunity to to try and, and be a part of that, that, that team. Yeah, for me, I think it's, um, it's looking back on the last 12 months and the perspective that it's given, not just myself, but I'm sure every single person, um, you know, it makes you, you know, really appreciate what's most important to you. Um, and actually looking forwards now, I'm obviously hoping for plenty of health and happiness for everyone in terms of uh, for what 2021 can bring. And like what Tess said, sport is a huge, huge aspect to that. Sport can bring so much happiness and joy to so many people's lives. It is so powerful. Like Nelson Mandela said, it's the most powerful thing within society. And, you know, looking ahead for us as a GB women's squad, um, you know, as you said, it's going to be a very hectic year for us. Um, but moving into obviously next summer and fingers crossed um, Tokyo um, going ahead as, as, as scheduled, it's, it's one of those and actually that will be the most incredible spectacle for the whole world to come together and really appreciate what kind of the last 12 months, 24 months at that point, would have brought and uh yeah so for me in terms of that it's, it's looking ahead using sport and international hockey for the greater good um and hoping that it's a really successful and happy time for everyone um moving forwards what a brilliant way in which to end the show thank you emily thank you tess for joining us and uh thank you all for listening as well huge thank you once again to Emily and Tess for joining us. Their passion for everything they talked about is so clear and we're so excited to see what they and the squad can continue to achieve on and off the pitch heading into the new year. Alistair and I will be back with another Sports Wheel episode soon, so make sure you become the first to know when it's released by ensuring that you have subscribed. And you can keep up to date with us too by following at Sports Pod on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.